A disgraced violin teacher convicted of sexual assault related charges faces his sentence. It's one that left victims shocked in the courtroom. A fire at Wineology at a second location and in less than two weeks, an investigation is underway. A live look here at Windsor, mainly cloudy, bit of wind today, but a nice mild afternoon. Rain is expected at the start of this week. We'll have Ian Black with the weather tonight. I'm Chris Ensing. Thanks for joining us. It's a day that survivors have spent years waiting for. Their former violin teacher sentenced to jail. Claude Tracy was convicted of 51 sex related charges and sentenced on 28 charges dating back to the 70s, all of this while working in Chatham. As the CBC's Amy Dodge reports, about 40 people gathered in the courtroom to hear Tracy's fate. Claude Tracy entered the courthouse this morning a free man, and he left the courtroom in handcuffs. He's been sentenced to eight months in jail, followed by two years probation. He's also facing 10 years where he can't go anywhere in public where there are children presumed to be there. That could be a park or a swimming pool or even a schoolyard. I did speak with his lawyer after the sentencing came down and hear some of what he had to say. He is truly uh, regretful and remorseful for what he put uh, those at that time young ladies through. Um, and he hopes that they're going to be able to heal. I also spoke with some of the victims who can't be identified because they're still under a publication ban, but who tell me they're not pleased with the eight months jail sentence. They said they don't believe that he's remorseful for what he did, and they don't believe that this sentence is actually accurate for the amount of abuse they went through. Some of these women faced 10 years worth of abuse. We heard numerous times how they were told to take off their shirts to be measured for a shoulder rest for their violin. A shoulder rest runs from around the collarbone area up to the shoulder, and he had them take off their shirts to make those measurements, something he didn't ask the male students or even his own daughter to do. I met with some of the victims afterwards, and here's some of what they wanted to say. I was actually shocked when the judge sentenced eight months, because in my mind I was thinking, that's eight days for every conviction, if you put it into that context. 27 charges, eight months is eight days for what he did to all of us. That he could compromise the sexual integrity of so many women. Um, those who spoke up at the trial and countless others who were not able or could not speak up and this is all he gets is just uh, beyond what I can even process right now. Tracy is being sent to Windsor today to start his sentence. Amy Dodge, CBC News, Chatham. Now, Amy has been speaking with some of Tracy's victims throughout the day, as you heard there. We're going to have more of their stories tomorrow on our show. A Windsor man has been sentenced to 15 years for the shooting death of a man on Oak Street back in December of 2015. Dia Hanan was found guilty of manslaughter last November in connection with the death of Alexei Goosehaven. Another man was left paralyzed as a result of the shooting. Hanan's sentence includes two years and five months of time already served. Several family members were at court today, including Hanan's mother, who says her son was acting in self-defense. My son is not, he's not guilty. Believe me, these people come in the home. Swear to God, I'm not lying to you guys. God, you know, everything. The decision has been to, to appeal the decision, uh, as, uh, and now also uh, the sentence. I, I don't know the timeline on that. Um, I'll be assisting him with that, and um, we'll be talking about that in, in the coming days. Hanan came to Canada as a boy with his mother and brothers as a refugee from Jordan. He now faces deportation back to Jordan once his sentence is completed, unless his conviction is overturned. There's a couple in Windsor who can't find a way home to their family in Lebanon. That's because on a U.S. fly list is their names. Now, the problem is flights from Canada to that region often cross into U.S. airspace. So now the family is searching for answers and away home. Our Jason Vio has this exclusive story. 
Last month, Salam Al Said Ali tried to fly from Toronto to Copenhagen, which would eventually take him to Beirut. But $1,500 later, he couldn't get on that plane because it briefly went over U.S. airspace. Now, all of this started about six years ago when the couple tried to cross the Windsor Detroit border for lunch and they were turned away by U.S. border guards. They stopped me from 5 o'clock afternoon until 6 o'clock at the morning. Yeah, just question and answer, question and answer, question and answer, fingerprint, finger, uh, eye print, everything, with my wife too. At the end, they said, uh, we don't know what's the reason. We have, uh, we have order, if we stop this passport, to tell them in Washington. Yeah, at the end, they said, uh, the decision, uh, we are not allowed to go to U.S. in all your life and we don't know what the reason. And they gave him my, they gave the Canadian my passport. He came and he told us, uh, they put your name in the blacklist. My wife asked him exactly, like, blacklist, what does that mean? He said, terrorist list. My dad, 80 year old. My mom, 73. And sick, you know? If anybody now from Lebanon, they will call me, or oh, your, your dad die, I, I can't go to see him. I feel I'm in big prison. Very, uh, very angry is the first thing, because there's no reason for it. There's nothing that we did. So anger is the first thing that, uh, that comes out, and frustration. And your hands are tied. You can't do anything. You, there's nothing. We're trapped and there's nothing we can do about it. There's and no what? help. Nobody will give you any answers. And usually you, know, you can always find a way or something, but no, you're completely, <coughs> totally stuck. Now the family did reach out to Windsor West MP Brian Massey's office, and he says there's very little that he can do in this case, but he did say that he could reach out to the Minister of Public Safety, send him a letter, and then the minister could then reach out to his American counterpart. But the minister's office and Global Affairs Canada said they wouldn't be providing a comment on this specific case. The TSA, the Transportation Security Administration in the U.S., would only say that they have exclusive and complete sovereignty over their airspace, the U.S. airspace, and the FBI telling CBC News that there is a redress program for travelers that's in place, but the family did pursue that route and they say nothing has changed. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor. There are now 27 confirmed cases of coronavirus in Canada, but so far, no deaths. The total jumped over the few days within those diagnoses. There was 10 new cases in Ontario. Three of those we're just today. Now, there are 18 cases in Ontario, eight in British Columbia, and one in Quebec. The World Health Organization is reporting that the global spread of the virus is changing. In the last 24 hours, there were almost nine times more cases reported outside China than inside China. Worldwide, there's more than 89,000 cases that have been reported in 61 countries. There have been more than 3,000 deaths. Japan, South Korea, Italy, and Iran are the biggest concerns right now. But the World Health Organization continues to downplay concerns about a pandemic. And it continues to promote aggressive containment measures as an effective way to control the spread of the virus. Council in Chatham-Kent will decide tonight whether or not to close Erie Shore Drive for good. Residents were upset last week with the town's decision to declare a state of emergency. The municipality is concerned about a potential breach of the dike along the road, which poses a safety risk for the properties and the people who live there. Residents say more time needs to be taken before council makes their decision. Well, we're going to ask that they do not pa uh, pass the bylaw and permanently uh, close the road. What we're asking for instead is for them to exercise their right to do, do a 30-day closure. This would enable them to do the immediate work that they feel needs to be done to secure the dike, but do it in a way that still allows as much room on the road as possible. In some cases, they can go on private property. We held an emergency meeting of our property owners association yesterday, gauge people's willingness, and the majority said that to keep the road open, they would be willing to put blocks on their road. And so we are just urging council to give us time to work together to, towards a more amenable solution that does not result in uh, properties being destroyed and quite frankly, people's lives being destroyed because they will be in financial ruins. 
That permanent closure, if put in place, would take hold on March 9th, and council's urging people to get out before then. Now, it's providing assistance packing and containers for storage, but for some, moving isn't easy in such a short amount of time. For this. It's a place to live. They want us out in one week. How can we do that? You know, pack all our stuff and everything. And, you know, call the insurance, call everything, shut everything down. I mean, in nine days, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's an unfortunate, yeah, it's a very unfortunate situation. And we under like, we understand that it's for safety and everything like that. It's just the fact that it's such a short period of time for people to pack up and leave their lifelong home knowing that they may never come back, right? And then it is with my parents having their special circumstances, like there's so much to consider finding them a place to live. Hughes and her husband, Ray, have both been in the hospital recently. Their daughter, Suzanne, came in from Vancouver to help the couple make arrangements, but it isn't clear what arrangements can be made for them. The town says that anyone who needs help arranging housing should call their main line. They should say that they live on Erie Shore Drive and a caseworker will be assigned to them immediately. A second winology restaurant has been hit by a fire in less than two weeks. Fire broke out this morning at the Tecumseh location. Crews had the flames under control at around 6.30 and the Ontario Fire Marshal's office is now looking into what caused those flames. On February 20th, the restaurant's Walkerville location was also gutted by fire. Officials said that fire was accidental, starting in the restaurant's kitchen, hood and exhaust system. It cost about $700,000 in damage. Well, it's been nearly six months since Windsor was told that a legal retail cannabis shop would be opening in the downtown core. Still not open, but we do have new details about how that store will be run and when people in Windsor can expect to buy legal recreational cannabis over the counter. Now, the new shop will be under the J Supply umbrella. Here's my chat with David Craig. That's their chief design officer. We're really excited because we, we, we see an, a resurgence of the community down there. Uh, one of the things uh, I'll tell you a little bit about is, is just our brand pillars. So there are five things that we associate our brand with, and everything that we do is based on that association. So the first one's education. Second one is social responsibility. Third one is community. Fourth is safety. And the fifth is health and wellness. So what we've been doing in order to sort of build our brand and, and our presentation in Windsor is, is going around and meeting with local businesses there and trying to really ingrain ourselves into the culture and the community. When this store was announced that this location was going to be where Windsor's first and for now only legal retail pot shop was going to open, uh, there was some pushback from both the police, from the health unit and the city talking about some challenges that they saw with this location. Uh, how are you dealing with that? So we've addressed every single one of them. Uh, we've had communications with the regulators at AGCO, with with the, the uh, municipal government in, in Windsor as well as the police. And they had some things that they wanted us to just take care of to make sure that we were operating in a responsible way. And like I said, it's important for us to be part of the community. So, so we've complied with that. So one of the things they wanted us to do is paint the back of the building white so it was nice and bright that, you know, if anybody was hanging out in the back alley, they could kind of see it or whatever. So we're just trying to work with the community. We're bringing something that's totally legit and legal to the community and, and it's been, it's very well received. We're, we're responding to what our responsibilities are. The person who uh, originally was attached to this location, are they still involved with the project? And when do you hope to actually have the doors open and available to sell this? So our group, J Supply Holdings Inc, uh, made a, an arrangement with him where we, we signed a consulting agreement. So Kirk still owns the store, it's his store. However, we're the consultants bringing in the brand, the store operations, um, all of our, our knowledge with regards to cannabis um, to present really a full packet, so, so to ultimately roll it out. Um, as far as opening, our plan is to open sometime between March 20th and March 27th. We haven't nailed it down 100% because it is a moving target, but uh, that's our goal. Groceries can take up a huge chunk out of monthly expenses. Sometimes that could mean sacrificing healthy for affordable. But does that always need to be the case? We organized a tour for one local mom around her local grocery store and handing out advice along the way, a nutritionist. Have a look. 
Hi, I'm Liz Sinisak. I'm a mom of up to feeding up to four kids. Hi, my name is Andrea Doherty. I'm a registered dietitian, and today I'm going to take Liz around the grocery store and give her some options for healthy, affordable foods. Some tips for looking to buy variety in your fruits and vegetables and save some money is try to buy what's in season. Also, you can go for um, frozen fruits and vegetables. They're sometimes even more nutritious than fresh. And the reason for that is because the produce is picked at its you know, peak ripeness, and that's at the time when that, that produce is highest in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. If you're looking for a healthy choice and something that's a bit more cost effective, I would say try to go for a big container of a plain yogurt and then adding your own um, fruit. If you go for something like a Greek yogurt or a skier, it's gonna have about three times the amount of protein as a regular yogurt. Beans are a great cost-effective way to add protein into your diet, but they're a really good way to kind of stretch out meat. So let's say you're taking a pound of ground meat and you're gonna be making some tacos or some pasta sauce, add in a can of lentils, and that's really gonna stretch out that meal a lot more. And um, you know, a can, as we can see, is gonna be less than a dollar. A lot of times when we see oatmeal, what's at eye length is a lot of these pre-packaged oatmeals. But if you are looking for something that's a healthy choice and a bit more cost effective, I would try to go for a big bag of plain and then kind of flavoring it yourself. If your kids really like apple cinnamon flavor, you can mix in some applesauce or some chopped apples plus some cinnamon. This is a great place to also use those frozen fruits. Again, you don't necessarily have to use fresh. You also kind of mentioned earlier you've been trying to meal plan more. Yeah, which is, which is great. That's also a really important way to not only eat healthy, but to save money. Um, because sometimes we have these great intentions of buying a lot of fruits and vegetables, and then we don't plan to use them, and then they kind of go to waste. And that's where some money can be lost. Love that tour of a nice little food market there. We should say that's a registered dietitian who was helping us out, getting some tips and tricks on what we can do to try and make that basket a little healthier and not have to worry about what's going on in our wallets. We have the weather coming up next. Ian Black from Ottawa with a little bit of a surprise.
Now, even if winter is not completely behind us, it isn't too early to start thinking about getting that garden started. Ground Culture is a Windsor-based company, and they hosted a class over the weekend. It was teaching some aspiring gardeners how to start seeding their gardens now, instead of waiting for the spring weather to set in. Take a look. <laughs> Mix your own right in there. We're learning how to start plants from seeds at home. Um, it's a great way to choose exactly what plants you want. It saves you money and it reduces your carbon footprint by just growing your food right at home. Planning your garden well ahead of time in the winter months helps inspire the gardener who's, who's been taking a break for a few months but also gets a head start on the year. You don't want it to be gushing water like this, that's too wet. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of the dry soil here. Come springtime, when everybody's starting to think about gardening, planning your garden well ahead of time in the winter months helps inspire the gardener who's, who's been taking a break for a few months, but also gets a head start on the year. Homegrown food is by far more nutritionally dense than food that you buy at the grocery store. You also get your choice of what you wanna grow. At home, the sky's the limit with what you can grow. You can order seeds from catalogs and you get those beautiful heirloom varieties. You can get varieties that are bred specifically for our climate. You can get the most colorful carrots you, you would never be able to find at the grocery store. And it just brings you outside, it promotes that connection with nature, takes us away from, from all of the, the busyness in our lives and just allows us to have a nice and healthy hobby. I'm doing red pepper and tomatoes and spinach right now. Why'd you choose those? Because they're my favorite and spinach is really good for you. <laughs> What's the hope for you taking this class? Um, actually to s start doing a little bit of uh, home gardening and something I'm just learning about and I'm very interested in it. What's kind of surprising you about this? Just the, the sheer little nuances that you need when you're starting things from seed, like packing the soil down, trying to think like, you know, how these plants are starting right from, you know, the get-go and the little things that they need to, to grow. The love. The little, yeah, the little extra love that you have to put into them. It's are neat. You, are you excited to have a garden? Yeah, I am excited to have a garden. <laughs> Time now for a look at our weather forecast today. I finally came back to work after a bit of a vacation, but our friend Colette Kennedy is away today. But luckily, we know a few people who can handle a forecast. We went straight to the nation's capital. Here's Ian Black at Ottawa. Chris, a very mild week on tap. A normal high would be about four. A normal low would be about minus four. And you'll be, for the most part, well above that. One exception, it looks like a cool day on Friday with a little bit of snow in the forecast. It will not last because... Uh, the weekend looks quite mild. It'll almost feel spring-like by the time Sunday rolls along. Quick look ahead. Six degrees at 8 p.m. You can see those temperatures getting down just below zero. Could be a few slick spots with that uh, drizzle on again and off again this evening. So watch out for that early tomorrow. But then uh, a pretty decent start to the day. Uh, generally bright. <laughs> Uh, but then things begin to change later on. Say goodbye to the rain that you had earlier today. The cold front working through will help to clear out those skies eventually. I'm keeping an eye on those winds that'll be out of the west-southwest. Uh, they'll pick up especially by uh, afternoon. Also going to watch that system. Looks like the bulk of it is going to move off towards the north, but it might have an effect uh, on the Windsor area. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so no major issues, just perhaps a few slippery spots first thing tomorrow and some limited sunshine, I think, to start your day. But then you can certainly see the clouds beginning to thicken up in the afternoon and late in the afternoon and evening, a chance of seeing some showers developing from that uh, other system off towards the west. No problems with the wind early, but boy, the gusts do pick up uh, late Wednesday and you'll be getting gusts that could get over 50 kilometers per hour. Okay. So in terms of your overnight low temperature, just below zero again, could be some slippery spots to start. Somewhere around nine degrees tomorrow, start with some sun, the clouds come in and then a shower by late tomorrow. Uh, seven day forecast certainly calls for some mild conditions. Look at those high temperatures, yes, just below zero at night, but sharply colder on Friday with a little bit of snow in the forecast. In behind that, cool to start your Saturday, but plenty of sunshine should send temperatures soaring uh, up to the 13 degree mark. Wow, look at the snow on the trees here north of Ottawa. Thanks to Claire for sending that in with blue skies. It is beautiful. Speaking of blue, there's a blue jay in the snow. Thanks to Jeremiah for that. And thanks to you, Ian, for giving us this update. 
We got a bonus day this year with a leap day on Saturday. A lot of ways to spend an extra 24 hours, but out in Leamington, well, there's something pretty rare that happened at the hospital. That story is coming up next. We now like to introduce you to Leamington's two leap year babies. That's right, there's two of them. This photo here is of little Gunnar Brassard, healthy and getting in a little nap there. And this is the second leap year baby, Samuel Ramirez. Now the chance of one baby being born on the leap day is one in 1,461. 
at 6.29 p.m. And that is it for CBC Windsor News. Now, before we go, we just want to leave you with one last look at that seating workshop. Now, locals were getting their hands dirty to get ready for spring. And now, if you want updates on this story or any of the others that you've watched tonight, you can go to cbc.ca slash Windsor. There's a council meeting in Essex happening right now that could have some interesting results. Our Jason Veal's there as well. Thank you for watching us. Enjoy the rest of your evening.